Hey guys, um, today is Friday, October 30th. Tomorrow's Halloween. There's also a really big football game tonight. We're playing Soto Central at home. Um, hopefully you did okay on the last unit test. You did okay on the last unit. Most of y'all did great on the last unit. Um, and hopefully you figured out that we are moving on to one of my favorite phylums. Um, we're moving on to phylum Mollusca. So we're going to talk about octopuses. We're going to talk about squids. We're going to talk about bivalves. We're going to talk about oysters, clams, um, <clears throat> sea slugs. I'm having trouble thinking. I'm sorry. It's early in the morning. Um, today there's a lot to do, a little time. I'm sorry this PowerPoint is so long. I tried to make it as small as I could and condense as much information as I could. Um, but there's a lot of information out there on mollusks, and a lot of them are so different from each other, and it's such a diverse phylum. It's really I think it's fun. Um, it's fun to get into the nitty-gritty. So let's talk about some general things about phylum mollusca. Um, some characteristics that they have. So they have a fully lined coelom. So their organs are freely floating and they're attached by that mesentery tissue. So if you were to dissect them and cut them open, which you can, you would be able to see their organs laying out. You'd be able to pick them up and touch them. They're not all attached to each other. They are bilaterally symmetrical and they have a three-part body plan. So in their body, they have a visceral mask. That visceral mass in a snail would be this area underneath the shell. So it's what contains their organs. They've got a mantle, which would be their shell. It's the outer layer of their body. It's what protects them. And then they've got a foot. And that foot is used for locomotion. And their shell either has, they either have one or they have two parts to their shell, including octopus and squid. Um, and that's what protects them. It's on the outside. And then they have a radula, and that radula is present in everything except the bivalves. And this is what the radula looks like. So the radula is a rasping tongue that's located in their mouth. So if you've never looked up close at a snail's mouth, congratulations, now you are. Here's what it looks like. And it's used to scrape and suck algae. It's located inside their mouth. This is an up-close view of it. So it has little backwards teeth that they push up against whatever they want to eat, and they scrape it. Some of them are modified to drill. Some of them are also modified to be used to kill prey. So not all of them are scavengers. They can also be carnivores. And we finally have true organ systems. We had them in the annelids, but we didn't really talk much about annelids. There's a lot to say there, but I know y'all would rather get on to like marine mammals and stuff. So I'm going to stop and talk about it now. The first organ system that they have is an organ system used for excretion, so how to get rid of their wastes. So they were the earliest line to develop an efficient excretory system. So phylum nematoda, phylum analydia, they have the excretory systems, but they're not as efficient as this one. So they use a coelom, or this area inside, as a collecting place for their waste-laden fluids. So they don't have kidneys like we have. They just go into this empty open cavity. Cilia pull the fluid into nephridia. So these guys are the nephridia. So cilia are going to pull that fluid into the nephridia. The nephridia recover the useful molecules, and they reabsorb them. And the remaining fluid leaves through the anal pore into the mantle cavity. From that mantle cavity, they're then excreted. Circulation, their digestive tissue is covered by a mesoderm. Remember we said they were coelom, they were true coelomates. So they have a digestive tissue. Um, because it's covered in mesoderm, they can't just excrete things out into the open. They have to process it somehow. It can't just it can't just diffuse. The diffusion is blocked now. So they have to have a circulatory system. So it forced the evolution of this circulatory system. So being a coelomate forced them to have circulatory systems. They have a three-chambered heart and an open circulatory system. The only exception to this rule is octopi and squid, which have a closed system. Um, they respire in a lot of different ways. Um, there are a lot of mollusks that live on land. Um, all of the ones that live under the water use gills in their mantle cavity. It's extremely effective, and about 50% or more of the oxygen that they that is in the water is absorbed through their gills. So that's a really, really high rate. You're going to see when we talk about fish, they're not quite that high. 
Uh, reproduction. We have males and females. So nematoda were great because we finally had an anus. These guys are great because, why is that thing up there? Um, these guys are great because we finally have males and females. Interestingly enough, sea slugs and oysters can change sexes. So a male can turn into a female and a female can turn into a male. They rely on the currents to distrib distribute their larva. Um, same thing with the jellyfish. They rely on the currents to move their larva around. Octopi and squid, again, again, are the exception to this rule, and they have eggs. So let's talk about some of the animals. Um, this is going to be on the next page of your notes. So if you flip your notes page over or scroll down, if you are typing it out, these guys are on your next page. So Cos polyplacophora are called chitin. They're all marine. Oh, excuse me, it's early. And they have a shell that's divided into eight overlapping plates. You can see this massive foot that's coming out from around them, right? So that's what makes them a cephalopod. They're class polyplacophorum. They're a mollusk. They've got a shell. They live on rocks. They feed on algae. They're all marine. Cast class gastropoda. They can be microscopic up to a millimeter long. They have retractable tentacles with their eyes located at the ends. They have a single shell or no shell at all. Um, they're known as univalves because they have one shell. They're herbivores. They get, these guys use their radula. They scrape it off rocks. Some of them are carnivores. The nudibranchs can use borrowed nidocytes and their radulas to eat. So this is kind of what a gastropod looks like. If you didn't figure out from the last slide, we're talking about snails. You've got your mantle cavity. You've got your anus, your stomach, your intestine, your mouth. So the first one we're going to talk about are pteropods. Um, if you can't tell by the picture, these guys do live in the abyss. They're all marine. What's really cool is they have a wing-like flap that they extend out, and they use it to swim in the water. So these guys actually swim with their marine flaps. You can see their shell back here. It's made of silica. This guy's starting to extend his little wing. So they really do like little, look like little iridescent butterflies swimming underneath the water. Um, some people also call them sea fairies. Their little wings flap. They look like little tinkerbells. Next, we've got class gastropoda and the oyster drills. So this is an actual oyster drill over here. You can see his foot kind of right here where the sand is. What makes these guys cool, why I'm going to talk about them, is they have a drill that they use to get into oyster shells. And once they drill into this, or the bivalve, once they drill in, they suck the in inside of the shell out. So they can decimate an entire reef. It's not a good thing to have these guys around all the time. And this is what the shells look like. So this shell has been attacked by an oyster drill. So you can see all the holes, and that's his radula. That's his modified mouth that's digging all of those holes into that shell. Next up are the really cute nudibranchs. Um, they're marine slugs. They lack a shell. They come in a variety of colors, a variety of shapes. They're very, very, very diverse. Um, these guys are special because they can actually eat the strings of jellyfish, and they can take the nidocytes from the jellyfish and incorporate them into the backs of their body. So when somebody goes to eat them because they're bright and colorful, they will get stung and release them hopefully quickly. All right, so next we're going to talk about bivalves. So we had our univalves in class gastropoda, and they had one shell. Our bivalves have two shells. So bivalves are sessile or sedentary. They can move, but not well and not much. Um, this includes your clams, your oysters, your shipworms, your scallops, and mussels. They are filter feeders. They have a two-part, two-hinged shell, and it's connected by their adductor muscle, and they have a foot that extends from their shell for movement. Scallops use their shell, and they clap it together like this, and it helps them move in the water. If you watched the Magic School Bus episode, um, Goes to Muscle Beach, it has everything you need to know about class bivalvia in it. If you haven't watched that episode, um, it's a great episode to watch and you will learn everything you need to know about bivalves. So here's their hinge. 
Their adductor muscles are up here in the front that allow them to open and close. This is what their adductor muscle looks like. So here's their posterior and here's their anterior. So this is considered their head and their back, I guess you could say. Here's their shell. So these are those adductor muscles and they snap and they can snap the animal shut extremely quickly and they can seal the animal shut. If you've ever tried to shuck an animal or open up one of these animals, you're using the knife to separate that adductor muscle from the shell. It's, it sounds easy, it's a lot harder than it looks. Their shell is secreted by a mantle and it's made of three layers. The outer horny layer protects against acids, the middle prismatic layer is made of calcium carbonate for strength, and the inner pearly layer is next to their soft bodies. The mantle secretes mother of pearl to surround irritants like grains of sand. This is how we get oysters. The oldest raised part of the shell is called the umbo. They have their adductor muscles. They lack a distinct head. They really don't have a head region. And they have an incurrent and excurrent siphon that circulates water over their gills. So here's our mantle area. This is an entire bivalve. You've got your muscles here, our mantle area. Here's that mantle again. Here's part of that muscle. Here's the siphon. That's what they can stick out of their shell in order to eat. Here's their siphon tubes. Here's their foot. This is what they're gonna use to dig into the water and dig into the sand and dig themselves holes. They do have a heart and an open circulatory system. They have a nervous system with sensory cells. They can detect light, they can detect changing chemicals, and they can detect touch. That's why if they have a grain of sand in them, they make a pearl. Cephalopods, last but least. These are my favorites. A cephalopod means head foot. This, guy, this class includes octopus, squid, cuttlefish, and chambered nautilus. I could literally spend the entire nine weeks just on cephalopods. Um, they're all marine. They're the most intelligent mollusk. They can open jars. They can open cans. They, If you've watched Netflix, um, there's a show on there right now about my friend the octopus. They can actually form a relationship with people. Highly, highly intelligent. They have a high emotional IQ as well. Um, they have a well-developed head. They are free swimming. Their foot is divided into tentacles. So those tentacles are actually the same thing as a snail's foot. And they're divided up and they have suckers on them. Their radula is inside all of their tentacles and it's modified into a beak shape. They're gonna use that to bite and eat their prey. They have a closed circulatory system. They lack an external shell, but they do have an internal shell. They have a highly developed nervous system. Their vertebrate, their eyes are as evolved as vertebrate eyes. So they can see like a cat, a dog, a human. They can actually see shapes. They have separate sexes, and these guys have internal fertilization, so these guys don't rely on trichophores and the currents. The first one we have is the squid, the largest invertebrate known to man, is the giant squid. It's large, it has a complex brain, it's got 10 tentacles, it's got the longest pair extend out, and they're called clubs, and they catch the prey. They use jet propulsion to move by forcing water out of their excurrent siphon. They have chromatophores in their skin that can help them change color for camouflage. They can squirt ink to blind predators. Their internal shell is called a pin. And they have a jelly-like material they lay their eggs in that protects them until hatching. The octopus has eight tentacles. It's very similar to the squid, except it crawls along the bottom looking for prey. Sorry guys. Next up is the chambered nautilus. You can see his foot right here that's modified into tentacles, <clears throat> eyeballs. He has an exterior shell that's divided into gas chambers. Those gas chambers, the, so the animal only lives in the last part of this shell. The rest of it are filled with gas chambers. He can add water, he can add water, add air to these chambers to affect his buoyancy so he can float and go up and down in the water column in order to eat. Um, they do move, they do go up and down in the water column. So cephalopods have no shell. 
They have adapted by using speed in camouflage. Their chromatophores expand and contract, causing changes in colors and patterns. And here's a video of that for you. So here's the octopus right here. And he literally disappears. He blends his body in so well with the floor. And they're able to do that extremely quickly and extremely effectively in order to disappear from predators and prey. Um, they do have reproductive sexes that allow that breed in shallow water. The male delivers the sperm to a female. Um, there's a special tentacle that has their reproductive structures on the end. They place that tentacle in her mantle cavity to fertilize her eggs. The octopus lays thousands of eggs and protects them for up to four months. Usually this is the end of the octopus's life. They die after the eggs hatch because they do not eat. They um, protect their eggs at all costs. They stand there and protect their eggs. They won't ever leave their eggs to eat. So usually after this incubation period of the eggs, the female octopus dies. And you can see here all the little baby octopi inside their eggs. Mollusks are extremely important to us. Um, they're used by humans for food. We use the pearls from oysters. Uh, we use their shells for jewelry. They do damage to crops. They do, oh, excuse me, damage to our gardens on land. And they serve as intermediate hosts for a lot of parasitic animals such as flukes. Um, that's all I have today. Um, you also have an activity on Schoology where you need to answer the questions about mollusks. And there's one where it talks about the external organs of squids. So it gives you all the information about where their arms, feeding tentacles, beak, mouth, head, all that good stuff is. And then it asks you to come over here. And label the squid. Excuse me. So here's the picture to label. And the, like I said, the information explains where everything is. <sighs> The picture information before it. Um, we're going to start mollusks today. This is also the um, it's like a reading answering the questions after you read the so it, it tells you a little bit about mollusks and then in chitons and then it has you label some pictures as you go along. And then it asks some questions. Octopus, you label an octopus, you label a bivalve, you label a clam. So a lot of good stuff in here. Um, stuff I went over in the PowerPoint and stuff you can find in the reading for that as well. This week, or next week, is going to be a little bit chopped up. Um, so we are starting mollusks today. I ordered planaria, which are a type of worm that we use in the lab that can regenerate. They are from Phylum Platyhelminthes. They will be here next Wednesday. So we are going to go with, on with mollusks next Monday and Tuesday. Next Wednesday, we're going to stop. We're going to go back to Phylum Platyhelminthes and because they are live animals that we're getting in. We're going to do a lab that contains those, and then we're going to go back to mollusks. So the November calendar is a little not messed up, but don't take it in stone. Those dates will change. Those labs will change around depending on when live specimens come in and what's going on. Um, I, I can't, I have to do what's best for the animals. So when those live specimens come in, we do kind of have to work around the shipping schedules of those companies. So don't take it with a as set in stone, it is going to change on a daily basis probably. So when you're checking Schoology, ch please make sure you're checking just that day. Don't look ahead because if you look ahead, those dates are going to change. Um, they're there as a guide. Definitely look ahead as a guide, but know that those dates are going to change. Um, I hope you have a good day. I hope you have a good weekend. If you go trick-or-treating this weekend, please be safe. And I will hopefully see you all again Monday.